Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jeffrey Wu with the Health Via Modern Nutrition HVMN podcast. This is your host, Jeffrey Wu. And I am super excited and elated to have Dennis McKenna on the program this week. Now, if you haven't heard of Dennis, he is one of the leading researchers and thought leaders within the psychedelic space. And for this conversation, I really want to move the ball forward. I feel like a lot of the conversations that talk about psychedelics is almost like a cultural commentary about, you know, the, uh, the sixties kind of experimentation, but as someone focused on human performance, physiology, metabolism, the data, the science being done in the space is really real. So excited to speak with you and really dive into the science and moving this space forward. Dennis, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So, Maybe to just set context here, obviously you've been one of the you know mainstay thought leaders in this field, and can you just walk us through the journey from kind of the the free love kind of experimentation days in the sixties, seventies, and fast forward to now in twenty twenty, where we just had Oregon decriminalize psilocybin and a number of other compounds, but primarily I think you know what we're interested in is the psychedelics and also serious academic research uh, folks looking at this for therapeutic use. I mean, just walk, walk us through just the, the personal journey before diving into the science here. All right. Well, I, I don't know how, how brief I can make this. You're asking me to uh, recount about 50 years or more of involvement. I mean, I did come out of the, the 60s and that whole era of social ferment and experimentation and so on. But pretty early on, I realized, I recognized that, you know, at the age of 18 or 19, I I was born in 1950. So the decade of the 60s was really my coming into adolescence and all that. And, you know, in the latter part of that decade, I was interested in psychedelics. My brother, uh, Terrence McKenna, of course, uh, was egging me on in this. He was already in Berkeley at that time, and I was still stuck in a small town in western Colorado. But one of the significant things that happened around that time was I stumbled across, or somehow I got my hands on an interesting book, which was called The Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs, which was uh, the proceedings of a symposium that was sponsored by the National Institute of Mental Health in San Francisco in, in 1967, right? That important sort of banner year for psychedelics and the countercultural movement. Nobody in San Francisco even knew about this conference before, you know, I think it happened in, in January 1967. It was a closed conference, and they published these proceedings. And and everybody who was in the field at the time, some of the, the uh, important scientific investigators, notably uh, Richard Schultes, the ethnobotanist from Harvard, Alexander Shulgin, the chemist that everyone knows about, they were at this conference. And it was the first conference where these professionals really gathered to sort of assess the state of the art. And, and, and that, that book was very influential in my decision to go in that direction because it made me aware that there was actually science behind this and it wasn't just people going out and and you know trying stuff and getting loaded there was i I mean we did enough of that but but there was a there was a scientific rationale behind it and i thought wow I, i could actually you know make a career, think about pursuing a career in this very interdisciplinary discipline, ethnopharmacology. And about the same time that I encountered this book, and I'm not even, I don't even remember how it came onto my radar, but about the same time my brother gave me for my uh, 18th birthday, he gave me the first of Carlos Castaneda's books, The Teachings of Don Juan. Even though subsequently we know that, uh, you know, uh, 
Uh, Carlos Castaneda probably made up a good deal of what he recounted in that book. But it was nonetheless influential because it made me, it was the other side of the perspective for me, realizing that there was science on one side and then there was the ethnography and, and all of the indigenous traditions and all that. And that seemed like a good match. So that that really set me on my course to study ethnopharmacology. And then, you know, time time went on. My brother and I went to Colombia in 1971 in search of this very obscure hallucinogen. And, you know, trying to be succinct here, we went there. And that became a whole, you know, story of our lives together, which I recounted in my book, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. <laughs> and and my brother wrote also in a, in a book called a True Hallucinations. Those of you who know the story of the McKenna brothers and their their adventures probably got it from those two books. I'm not going to go into detail there, but so flash forward 10 years from 1971, and I was a graduate student at the University of British Columbia, studying for my PhD, and I uh, ended up focusing on ayahuasca as the the main topic for my PhD there, the, the botany, the chemistry, the pharmacology, partly the ethnography. So I worked at UBC for years, and and then I went to, I actually got a fellowship at NIMH uh, uh, in 19, 1986. So I went to Bethesda and did this fellowship in the Laboratory of Clinical Pharmacology at NIMH. And not working on ayahuasca, but still working on psychedelics. And did that. And then I did another postdoc at Stanford. And then I... Uh, uh, I started working for a startup pharmaceutical company in the Bay Area in 1990, uh, basically, and it was called Shaman Pharmaceuticals. So you can probably tell by the name, it was ethnobotany-driven drug discovery. And I was able to take all the skills that I'd acquired in these two postdocs, having to do mostly with doing receptor binding uh bioassays and that sort of thing, and apply that in in this, what was really my first job. So I worked on that and then became disillusioned kind of with the way they were doing things. I realized I didn't really fit the corporate mold. I was offered a job at Aveda <laughs> uh, in Minnesota, which is the cosmetics company, and I went there. And they sent me, or they let me go, I should say, to Brazil in, I guess it was uh, 1993, I was able to, I carried out a biomedical study of ayahuasca uh, with the UDV, which was one of the syncretic Brazilian churches that used uh, ayahuasca. So that was also an important study. And then, you know, time went on and uh, I ended up teaching ethnopharmacology at the University of Minnesota. I started in 2002 and kept that going until 2017. In 2019, we moved to Canada. My wife is Canadian, so it was lucky for me that I could just move up here. And then recently, I founded this nonprofit called the McKenna Academy for Natural Philosophy. And people could look at that on the on the web, just uh, McKenna dot Academy, and and see what we're up for, up to. So that's a thumbnail sketch of fifty years. Uh, you know, I, I have a talk I give sometime called "Climbing the Vine: Forty Five Years of Ayahuasca," which I won't bore you with, but I actually need to change the title and put it fifty years. So that that's where we're at. Yeah, I don't mean to be glib to to fast forward 50 years of work here, but we'll, we'll, we'll have in this conversation, dive into each section here. Hey guys, this is Jeff Wu interrupting my podcast for a special offer, a special announcement for you. As you might know, HVMN just launched the new Keto Food Bar and they're yummy, they're delicious. And I wanna make a special personal offer for you to give you a discount to get those into your hands. So for a limited time only, use the discount code Jeff10. That's G-E-O-F-F-10. 
number one, number zero, Jeff10 for a 10% discount on the keto food bar on hvmn.com. We got Mexican hot chocolate, one of my personal favorites. We got vanilla shortbread, we got chocolate chunk, and of course, we got the everything bagel, which is legit savory, garlicky, oniony. And these have become staples in my own personal life. I like to eat this with a cup of coffee for breakfast. I've been using the Mexican hot chocolate, the vanilla as grab and go bars when I'm biking, when I'm out on the town, when it's not easy for me to eat healthy, eat keto. So these are certified organic. They actually are yummy. They aren't these weird synthetic artificial tasting bars you might see that are keto compliant, but have a bunch of fake IMOs and things that actually spike glycemic response. And of course, while they're also certified organic and they actually taste good, these have been tested on continuous glucose monitors. So they actually have flat glycemic response on your blood sugar. So essentially it's a, a fasting mimetic, but we're still delivering almost 300 calories of healthy fat and 12 grams of healthy protein and grass-fed collagen. These are legit. I'm so excited for you to try them and use my personal discount code, Jeff10, to get a special 10% discount. So check it out and enjoy and back to the program. Before going back in time to talk about pharmacology and ethnography, I do want to get a sense on the acceleration of the cultural acceptance back in the 60s and 70s, and then the kind of the shutdown from the federal government in terms of scheduling these things as Schedule One compounds, aka illegal drugs. And now it, the, 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 you know, it looks like it's swinging back in terms of liberalization of how government is regulating that. In your kind of seeing this flow of acceptance, cultural change, do you see an inflection point in 2020? Or is this just kind of just a notch and just the ebb and flow of just human you know, human foibles? No, no, I, I do think there's an inflection point. I think that you know, uh, in the first place, the 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 prohibition of these substances at the end of 19, the 60s, around 1970, the the uh, you know the war on drugs, the prohibition within the states and globally through the UN Convention on Psychotropic Substances, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, it was totally misguided. You know, there was no, these, these psychedelics, may, other drugs may be more dangerous and, and may need to be more, more stringently regulated, but psychedelics are inherently not that dangerous. But there was a great deal of cultural backlash because of the counterculture at the time, you know, and there was concern, you know, Timothy Leary was promulgating LSD and LSD was pretty much what there was in, in the society. And, you know, it was, it was, you know, I mean, the politicians never, never hesitate to jump into controversy like this, whether they know anything about it or not, you know, and most politicians are dismally ignorant of, of things like psychedelics and, and generally dismally ignorant of science in general. So a lot of decisions were made that really had no basis. There was no reason that these things should have been prohibited in such a draconian way to make them schedule one substances, which means they have absolutely no medical value, they're dangerous, you know, and, and basically those, those two things, that they have no possible medical application. Of course, the contemporary science that we've seen has emerged in, uh, in, you know, in the last two decades or even really beginning in the 90s doesn't support that. You know, there's an enormous amount of data now that shows that these substances can be very therapeutically beneficial used in the right context. But back in the 60s, it was all about, you know, I mean, LSD was a cultural catalyst. LSD, the reason that psychedelics had to be prohibited or why they were prohibited so stringently at the end of the 60s, it was not because they were inherently dangerous. It was because they made you have dangerous ideas. 
you know, and this is what the powers of be were reacting against. You know, the idea, for example, that you needed to go to Vietnam and kill people you never met. People were pushing back against that, and LSD was a catalyst to make people think about that. Or the idea that the best you could hope for is work in a cubicle for some faceless corporation for most of your life so that they can turn you out on the street at the end of your career and you don't get any benefits. People were reacting against this kind of corporate, militaristic, quasi-fascist perspective, which was uh, which was what reigned in that time. So yeah, they do. They, I mean, Terence used to say, and I would agree, psychedelics are dangerous because they give you dangerous ideas or funny ideas, as he used to call them. They give you those too. But now this has changed, you know, and it's changed largely because through the years, you know, many very accomplished scientists, clinicians, and so on have recognized that there is value in these substances. And, you know, that there's much less, well, for one thing, I think one of the factors is that they've now been around in society for 40 or 50 years. They're much less scary, you know, just because they were made illegal doesn't mean they went away. All attempts to prohibit substances are bound to fail. It, it has nothing to do with protecting people from dangerous substances. You know, it's about, it's about controlling people's behavior and what they choose to think. You know, there, there's a lot of issues around cognitive liberty here. The war on drugs is a war on consciousness. And, of course, it's a war on people. And, you know, all of this is being sort of acknowledged now, you know, as we – look at these decriminalization movements that are going on and not not on a, a well in a state level and a couple states like um, Oregon has uh, uh, you know passed an initiative that psilocybin is legal to use in therapeutic context that's a tremendous step forward even though it's still fairly timid step but it's it's a big difference so with respect to your question is this an inflection point yes i think so you know because because there's no going back you know these things are not going going to be blanket prohibited like they were before and because you know uh there's plenty of science now good science done by credible investigators that show that these things have a lot of potential for therapeutic uses. So that's very encouraging to me. That doesn't mean it's going to be simple to move forward, but you just go through the conventional channels for approval of any drug, which is the usual FDA protocols, and psilocybin is the first one, but not the last one that has gone through that process. And it will become approved for use. MDMA is is the other one, and MDMA is close behind. I think you'll also see it opening up for LSD again. Ketamine is also getting some traction as well. Ketamine is getting traction, yeah. But ketamine has, it's been easy for ketamine because it has other medical uses. So it was all as, you know, a dissociative anesthetic and so on. So it's always been easier for ketamine because to use it in, in psychedelic therapy is, just amounts to an off-label use. You know, uh, it's already a approved and clinicians can use it off label for therapy so yes you're right ketamine was one of the one of the first ones and now there are a number of places uh, that you can get ketamine therapies and it's it's legal and accessible yeah i'm i'm optimistic and and and, and i i agree with you in terms of this being an inflection point and i'm hopeful and I think part of it is these long form conversations. I know you've you know spoken very openly and very credibly on this space for years. And I think with the rise of podcasts, long form conversations, decentralization of information through the internet, I think if there is signal, which there clearly is signal here with the therapeutic value of psychedelics, then I think average people can make sense of what seems to work and what doesn't seem to work right and i think eventually the truth comes out and p- 
people bend towards what works, let alone, I think, the ethnography, which is very interesting, whether that's the Amazonian cultural traditions with ayahuasca or you know, the Greeks and maybe paleo Christians. I think there's interesting kind of yeah, theories and, and work there. And I know you talked about the stone date theory. So I do want to talk about the ethnography, but before going there, let's talk about the pharmacology side. So what are the mechanisms, maybe generally speaking, in terms of the principal approach with psychedelics or hallucinogens at the neurochemical level? And what does that imply for therapeutic use, which is a popular exploration point, whether it's PTSD, anxiety, smoking cessation. And then I think just particularly interesting for the HVMN community, potentially exploring enhancement applications. Obviously, I think, you know, there's been discussion around entheogen or, or consciousness expanding or, or spirituality inducing effects of hallucinogens or psychedelics. But are there other quote unquote biohacking or human enhancement potential explorations that scientists or, or personal experimenters can explore? Well, yes. And the answer to all of that is yes, there are, you know, you do not have to be sick. You don't have to have a mental disorder to benefit from taking a psychedelic because they are tools for exploring consciousness for bringing a different perspective to your work, in a sense, you can get in. It, it, I mean, one of the chief therapeutic benefits of, of psychedelics that I, I think is at the root of both the therapeutic use and the consciousness exploration use is they let you step out of your reference frame. They let you step away from your existential situation and look at your situation in a from a slightly different perspective. And that can lead to great insights in terms of Things like depression and addiction and trauma and and these sorts of things, which are, which are you know, uh, this is what psychedelics are best used to treat. But then there is this issue or this other use, which uh, Bob Jesse, who's kind of a well known advocate in this area, calls the betterment of the well. You know, in other words, enhancement of consciousness and using them as a learning tool. And it's been demonstrated that they can, in fact, give you insights about natural processes. Uh, there have been, you know, one example is Carrie Mullis, who is a Nobel Prize winner who used LSD and was very out front about how LSD had aided him in understanding molecular processes of, of, you know, he could get down among the molecules, as he put it, and actually see how this gene transcription process was working in his visions that enabled him to develop the PCR, polymerase chain reaction technology that is now, you know, a multi-billion dollar industry. And he won the Nobel Prize for it. And he was quite out front about it, that LSD assisted him in this. Steve Jobs is another person who very honestly said, you know, his experiences with LSD were very important to him as a younger man in designing the Mac operating systems and ultimately the iPhone. Even uh, Francis Quick, Crick, who was one of the co-discoverers of of DNA, he always denied that he'd ever taken any psychedelics and, you know, put it down and so on. Toward the end of his life, he admitted that he had and that LSD had been helpful to him, you know, uh, in understanding the mechanisms of DNA and how, how all that worked. So I sometimes say in my talks that psychedelics can be like a lens, you can think of them as a scientific instrument almost. And they give, you know, looking through the lens of, of something like psilocybin at nature, at natural processes or, you know, uh, realms of like mathematics and uh, molecular biology and all of these things, you can see it from a different perspective and you may gain insights into how things work that are normally not open to you because a lot of what's called the default mode network 
is is directed towards shutting down or restricting what we apprehend, you know, and psychedelics temporarily disable this default mode network. And they open you up to both internal and external stimuli, stimuli that the, the brain has been programmed to filter out, you know, I mean, the, the actual technical term for this is neural gating. Neural gating is essentially a mechanism that we've evolved to direct our attention toward what the brain is telling us is important for our immediate survival and to filter the extraneous stuff, the non-relevant stuff out. Well, psychedelics are very valuable. That, usually that is useful, but sometimes it's useful to disable that. So then you're aware of this wider realm of apprehension. Aldous Huxley talked about this in The Doors of Perception. You know, he, he, he called it the reducing valve. You know, the, the, you know the, 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 the portal unconsciousness that restricts what's gets, what gets in. So same idea, the default mode network, the reducing valve, and uh, psychedelics disable that. And that can be very useful therapeutically and also for insight, for consciousness enhancement. So we sort of got off on a tangent here about that, but with respect to the mechanism of, the, of most of these things, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, uh, what I do is I make a distinction be between what I call true psychedelics and other substances that are maybe like quasi-psychedelics. And what I mean by that is, just for a matter of convenience, I define true psychedelics very strictly. And I say true psychedelics are 5-HT2A agonists. So, so serotonin, they work on serotonin. The other term for serotonin is 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine. There is about 14 different subtypes of 5-HT or serotonin receptors in the brain and actually all through the body. One of those receptors, the 5-HT2A receptors, are the common target for true psychedelics. LSD, DMT, uh, psilocybin, 5-methoxy, DMT, mescaline, all of these things primarily work through the 5-HT2A receptors. So just as a matter of convenience and as a way to define this this group of true psychedelics, I you know I just arbitrarily say they have to be 5-HT2A agonists. Now there are a lot of related compound. There are a lot of compounds that will produce profoundly altered states, but under this strict definition, they're not true psychedelics. You know, one of those would be, for example, ibogaine or salvia divinorum or even MDMA. M MDMA is not a true psychedelic. It works in a different way. It works on the it works on the serotonin transporters, not on serotonin receptors. So there is this group of you know what you might call quasi psychedelics. They have profound. They induce profound states. But they're not strictly in the very, you know, sort of pharmacology sense. They are not true psychedelics. They're, they're, they're similar to psychedelics. That doesn't mean they don't have therapeutic, uh, therapeutic properties, something like MDMA, certainly, or Ibogaine. You know, Ibogaine is becoming recognized, has been recognized as especially efficacious for treating addictions. Uh, especially opiate addiction. MDMA is being advanced to through the FDA primarily for treatment of PTSD, but they have different mechanisms. You know, they're they're not quite the same as psilocybin or DMT, which is or LSD. These are clearly you know true psychedelics in in this in, in this under this way that I define them long-winded sorry interesting so they're essentially targeting cofactors or, or transporters and i i mean i think it's it's actually quite useful to just define it technically right if 5-he2a agonists are the primary targets 
I mean, one, that's interesting from a science perspective and two, as an analog development or a drug development perspective, I mean, that just falls within line with traditional pharmacology, right? Like when cancer drugs or diabetes drugs are targeting, usually they find small molecules that hit or antagonize or agonize some receptor or some transporter. So I think it's helpful to frame the context of psychedelics or hallucinogens within traditional pharmacology. I think that just helps move the space forward. So I think it's cool that I didn't I didn't know that 5-HE2A was like the like the the shared core between an LSD and an ayahuasca and a DMT, which is interesting. Yeah, it's it's kind of at the center of this group of compounds that you can call true psychedelics. Some of these other things, like salvia divinorum, is a good example. You know, the mix the magic Mexican mint and salvinorin A. It tires and targets an entirely different group of, of receptors. It actually targets the kappa opiate receptors. And opiate receptors, there are three kinds, kappa, mu, and delta. And the cap, you know, mu is what narcotics target, morphine and heroin and these sort of things target the mu receptors. Salvinorin A targets the kappa receptors and it does so very selectively. In fact, it's maybe the most selective drug that's ever been discovered. It hits only the kappa opiate receptors, and it's extremely potent. And it produces, you know, very bizarre altered states. Most people don't care for it. Some do, but whether it has therapeutic application or not, that that's remains to be seen. But that's one example. Or ibogaine. It it doesn't really fit. It doesn't really hit the 5-HT2A receptors. It actually hits a number of receptors, some of which are uh, serotonin, but there are other receptors involved uh, as well. And it's much less specific, you know. Now MDMA works on the serotonin transporter. It works on the same site in that that SSRIs work on the. They're called SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And what they what they block are these reuptake pumps. In- and those are all the popular antidepressants. Right. These are the popular antidepressants. Yeah, for folks who aren't familiar with SSRIs. Those are those are like Prozacs that ten percent of us are popping. Yeah, exactly. Pro- Prozac is the classic the classic SSRI. And it it so the, the serotonin transporters are in the presynaptic membrane, and effectively, these transporters, you know, the, the serotonin is released into the synaptic cleft, and then it travels to the receptor in the postsynaptic membrane, so the postsynaptic neuron binds there, whatever happens, happens, but then there are these pumps in the presynaptic membrane that basically suck the serotonin back up and repackage it, you know, because serotonin is metabolically expensive to make in terms of expenditures of ATP. So it repackages it. SSRIs block that process. You know, if you think of these pumps as a vacuum cleaner, kind of, that reuptakes the serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors block that, that process. MDMA binds to the same transporters and does exactly the opposite. If if SSRIs jam the vacuum cleaner closed, MDMA jams it open. <laughs> and, and all the serotonin leaks out all at once and basically front floods the brain with serotonin and you feel euphoric. You feel very, you know, all the things that MDMA makes you feel, you know, but it's a it's a really different mechanism, and that's one reason why after you you take MDMA, it's like basically you, an indirect. Mechanism. It's indirect, yeah. I mean, it still involves serotonin, but it involves basically just flooding the brain. It also depletes serotonin, you know, which is, and it takes a while to regenerate it, which is one reason why after an, an MDMA trip, especially if if it's a high dose, you know, y- you feel like shit the next day, you know, because, you know, you, you've, you've depleted all your serotonin, you know, so, but, but the body regenerates, you know, and it, it comes back. So to, 
follow down the analogy of pharmaceuticals or pharmacology in you know it, with my knowledge of drug development people or you know folks like to target clean targets right like small molecules that just affect a receptor it, without a lot of off targets or side targets right like the off target effects are what crippled a lot of drug development so curious to get your thoughts on if there's a cleanliness of hitting 5-HC2A, do you have a ranking of the compounds that are well known in terms of the cleanliness of hitting the 5-HC2A receptor as an agonist? Are there beneficial side targets or off targets? Clearly, there likely is pros and cons of the modalities of, you know, whether it's an LSD or a, you know, a psilocybin. Can you talk us through kind of the trade-offs, pros and cons from a pharmacology or receptor perspective? Yeah, yeah, I can. So yeah, the, the sort of the holy grail of drug development is often to make these highly selective compounds that only hit one receptor, the receptor target. Salvador A is a good example, even though it's a natural compound. There are very few substances that I know of that are that selective, you know. And so the 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 search to find a more or less selective drug is kind of a pipe dream, you know. For example, LSD. LSD will interact, you know, primarily with the 5-HT2A receptors but also with the 1A receptors and the 1B receptors and dopamine and, you know, other receptors. And, and LSD is a classic example of what pharmacologists sometimes, sometimes call a dirty drug because it has multiple receptor interactions, maybe one primarily, but it's a dirty drug. That's not necessarily a bad thing because the richness and the, the depth of a psychedelic experience is often more profound, more apparent if you use a dirty drug, you know, because you get these other receptor systems are contributing to it. There are substances that are extremely selective for the 5-HT2A receptors. So some of these are, in fact, this is what I did my work on at NIMH when I was a postdoc there. There's a substance, these are compounds that uh, Shulgin has had developed over time. And one of these is called DOI. And DOI, and it, it, it chemically, it's 2,5-dimethoxy-4-iodo phenylisopropylamine for the, those of you that care about the chemistry, DOI only hits the 5-HT2A receptors. You know, it's, it, it's very, very selective for that. And it is definitely a psychedelic, but people that have taken it, I have not, but people that have taken it, it, it produces a long-lasting psychedelic experience. Depending on dose, it can be anywhere from, you know, 12 to 36 hours. And some of the analogs of it, DOB is another one that produces these long-lasting effects. And they are psychedelics, but they have they have a shallowness to them, I guess you could say, that some of the other less specific drugs don't have. You know, uh, I mean, you can get there, you can get the effect, but, you know, the richness of the experience, it's kind of like an impoverished psychedelic experience, if if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, just to maybe just to, to bring an analogy towards a lot of folks that might be following metabolic health or longevity, a lot of people think the holy grail is like exercise in a pill. And that's hitting mTOR or other or pathways. And clearly exercise or fasting is a dirty drug. It hits a lot of pathways all at once, right? Exercise is not just mTOR activation. It's not just a AMP kinase activation, right? It just it's it's a complex web of interactions. And it sounds like that's kind of been the the failure with finding exercise memetics, where you might find one specific thing to target from a drug perspective. But I think it, it I think it kind of rings full circle back to the psychedelic realm where you might get you know, you hit the exact clean target, but it's not as a quote unquote deep, holistic experience, more shallow experience. Obviously, it's a little bit more, I would say, subjective, but I'm curious, like, to dive one layer deeper, uh, what is shallowness here? Is it just that you need a cascade of these uh, receptors that 
be agonized and antagonized to get the, the kind of the, the neurochemical state that induces, you know, spirituality or some of these realizations? Is it just like the brain is too complex that it's like figured out with like one single target? Exactly. It doesn't work. I mean, we're, we're not simple systems, you know, and, and the consciousness as we experience, and, you know, in the present moment, in the, you know, from moment to moment is a product in part of the interactions of multiple receptor systems that are always going in some respects. And, and that, whole gestalt of these systems working together is, you know, plays a role in what we call subjective experience or consciousness, you know, and with psilocybin, you know, it, it is, it primarily interacts with the one, with the 5-HT 2A receptor, but it also interacts with the 5-HT 1A receptor. And the 5-HT1B and other receptors. And it has, I mean, these all contribute to the depth of the experience, really. And, you know, the mystical experience seems to be pretty linked to this multiple interaction. You know, I mean, another example is uh, 5-HT comparison between DMT and 5-methoxy DMT. Uh, You know, and DMT is pretty much a fairly selective for the one for the 2a receptors 5-methoxy dmt has interactions with the 1a and the 2a receptor and dmt is highly visual lots of internal behind the eyelid hallucinations and a whole bunch of other things too like the emotional states and so on 5-methoxy dmt has all that but no visuals you know, which is interesting for most people, no visuals. And that's because it activates the 1A receptor as well as the 2A. But these two receptors are kind of, they cancel each other out in a certain way. Their 1A receptor tends to block 2A receptor effects and that kind of thing. So you can't really look, just looking at pharmacology and receptor profiles, you know, you're missing a lot if you try to reduce it to that, you know, because there are these these interactions. And then when it comes to natural psychedelics, even more so, because, you know, natural psychedelics contain usually a, a family of compounds or something like LS, uh, like ayahuasca. You know, there there's the so-called an entourage effect. You know, you get a different state of consciousness if you have multiple interactions of uh, receptors of, of, you know, a family of related uh, molecules and, and in plants, that's what you get. So, so ayahuasca, you know, al- although the, uh, the primary constituent is, is DMT orally activated by monoamine oxidase inhibitors, but those monoamine oxidase inhibitors are beta carbolines. Beta carbolines have their own, activity as uh, as psychoactive substances so taking ayahuasca is very different than taking dmt you know uh, even though it's there it's a component of the experience but you know well for one thing of course uh, dmt is not orally active unless you activate it with an mao inhibitor so that that's the basis of the pharmacology of ayahuasca but what, when you take it as an orally active preparation, then, you know, if, if, if you smoke DMT, it's 15, 20 minutes. It's very quick and it's over, you know. But, but if you activate it with an MAO inhibitor and take it orally, then you stretch that out to six or seven hours. And it's quite different, you know. It's, it's not like taking a, a ride on this, uh, you know, neon roller coaster through hyperspace. It's a little more chill, <laughs> you know, and you get more out of it because you can spend what you sacrifice is you sacrifice intensity for depth, I guess you could say. You know, with, with ayahuasca, you can spend more time in this place and bring more back from it. You know, one of the drawbacks of DMT is it's extremely intense, but it's extremely fast. And 
you know, the net effect is often, you know, just astonishment, like being hit by a freight train or something. And yeah, you might survive and you know that it was profound, but you're saying, holy shit, what was that? You know, and there's not a lot, you know what I'm saying? You can't, you can't really uh, integrate that very well. But these things have their their uses too. These short acting tryptamines, you know, and and there there's some very interesting work going on with things like DMT and five methoxy to extend the experience, you know, which you can do with MAO inhibitors. But you can, you know, you can extend them in very specific ways and control kind of the the level that you want to get to with these things. And then you know, so so there is that work going on too. And, and that's that's not a lot of that work is going on in the UK at the Imperial College with uh, Robin Carhart Harris and folks like that who whose name will be known known to people if they know psychedelic research. Yeah, I think one point that you bring up that I think is worth diving into a little bit more is this entourage effect or ensemble effect, where the stacking of compounds seems to be more synergistic than, than the compound itself or just the single target itself. And then I would say that some people who are proponents of the space talk about this entourage or ensemble effect more in mystical terms. Like this is like some ancient bio technology that is like almost magical. Or is this just something that neurochemistry, biology is too complicated for us to compute and quantify? So it's it's something that's we do not understand all the interactions. We have not mapped out all the different cascades of, of the different targets activating all at once. There's likely some personalized response to these inputs as an additional confounder to make this more complicated. So maybe the question to, to, to state it more clearly is, do you ascribe more mystical kind of effect towards this entourage effect or ensemble effect? Or do you simply boil it down to it, this is just too complicated for us puny brains at in, in 2020 to fully understand yet and it's something that we could potentially understand as we break out more understanding of how these neurochemical cascades connect and how the, all these receptors connect like is this magical or is this something that we can fully understand no it's not magical i don't think it's magical i, th- I think it's complex <laughs> you know as you say it's very complex and it's incompletely understood what's going on, but this is not, you know, this is not some magical effect. It's just that our scientific understanding of how these things interact with this array of receptors, you know, uh, which there are about 50 different types of neurotransmitter receptors. Uh, and it's, it's, just, it's just that these interactions are very complex, that's all. And hard, hard to map out, you know. I mean, you can study these things in animal models, for example. You can, you know, a simple example is, you know, you can take psilocybin, which is a 5-HT2A agonist, right? There are also 5-HT2A antagonists that are known. And logic would tell you that if you took one of these antagonists before you took psilocybin, it would probably block the effect. Well, guess what? It does block the effect. So this is just an example of one type of interaction. The problem with science, you know, Jeffrey, I mean, I don't know if it's a problem. It's just it's just something that science has to deal with, which is that in order to study anything, you have to reduce the number of variables, you know, and isolate these variables and look at that. And when, when you get into the neurochemistry, the neuropharmacology of, you know, these drugs, and then even more so with the, with the plant drugs, these are inherently, by definition, these are multivariate situations. So it's very hard to dissect out what exactly is going on. You can be cognizant of that. You can realize it's going to be an incomplete picture, but you just keep after it. You just keep elucidating more and more. You can look at other types of antagonists and, and you know, you, you can you can suss it out. I mean, I think for for somebody to throw up their hands and say, well, it's just it's just a magical effect. 
you know, um, this is giving up, you know, <laughs> because saying it's a magical effect ex- explains nothing from a from a scientific point of view. I mean, it's just like it's not useful. Uh, you know, at that point, the conversation ends. Okay, it's a magical effect. Great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think just even like just understanding that all the intermediates of the Krebs cycle, right, ATP production might have seemed like magic or, or super complicated, you know, two two centuries ago, but now it's fairly mapped out. And I, I'm hopeful that we can do the same thing with neurochemistry, which is, you know, looks like just a couple orders of magnitude more complicated with all the different interactions. So, uh, I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on, you know, folks like Joe Rogan, they talk about they believe that this is like a portal to like alternate dimensions. You know, what is your take on that? Is that just like a crazy personal subjective, I don't want to say delusion, but just like a self kind of state that they're talking about it? Is that just like a poetic term of describing a unique mental state? Or is this a little bit more pedestrian where like these compounds have induced some very, very interesting cognitive state and you're doing something there? I mean, Having just had this conversation about how, you know, it, it's not a mystical thing. It's about this complex interaction of of neurotransmitter systems and, and uh, you know, brain processes. But that said, I mean, I used to believe that things like DMT were actually portals to other dimensions, you know. This is what got my brother and I interested in all this back in the 60s. We were not particularly approaching it from a shamanic perspective or a spiritual exploration perspective. We were science fiction nuts, you know. We we thought maybe this actually is a dimension that you can access. I wouldn't say that it's not, you know. I, I mean, I think that one of the beautiful things about science, or maybe maybe people who are not science would say would would not think of it this way, but the suspended judgment is a very important thing in science, you know, and it allows you to wiggle out of answers to a lot of these very difficult questions because you can say our understanding is incomplete. We don't completely, we don't have enough data, so we will withhold judgment, you know, and until we have more data. And so you can say, well, that, you know, you're, you're, you're just, you know, you're just dodging the question. Well, yeah, we are dodging the question because all all scientific knowledge is is almost by definition incomplete. You know, there's always something else, some other piece of the puzzle that we don't have. So we can have this whole conversation about neurochemical interactions, multiple receptor systems, and uh, and all that going on, and and it's perfectly legitimate. You know, to say that at the same time, say that how do we know that that does not put you in a place where, you know, you can access some kind of quantum phenomena where these, these, you know, space time portals open up, you know, and one does not exclude the other necessarily. I, I don't, you know, so I, I, don't, I don't think we know. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, yeah, I think that's a very fair statement. I think it's, when sometimes people ask scientists, do you believe in God? It's like, I think a principal answer is agnosticism, where it's like, there's no definitive proof that there is no, you know, magical man in the sky, right? Or, or, or not a magical man in the sky. So I think it's like a very similar, similar, you know, similar question here. Yeah, it's a complex question, because it, first of all, you talk about these things, you have to be careful how you define your terms, you know? I mean, do I believe that there's some bearded guy in the in the sky that's uh, running the whole show? Absolutely not. I've seen no evidence of that. But do I believe that intelligence and consciousness is fundamental to the structure of the universe? Yes, I do. I think that that's that's at the from every level of organization from the sub atomic to the macrocosmic, if you look at the universe, you look at phenomena, you realize it, it, it is intelligent. At least it appears to be intelligently structured. 
it's not like there's some somebody outside of that system that is making this happen. It is the system itself, you know, that is self-organizing and 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 in some sense conscious. You know, I mean, if I believe in God, I would have to say God is the universe waking up to itself. You know, that that would be my sort of spiritual take on on all this. Yeah, no, it's a poetic definition. There's clearly some structure in this universe. And I think I, I think I would agree with you. I think I used to be growing up. I didn't really follow any religious tradition that used to be much more classical atheist. But I think. There's clearly some structure to the universe, and like I don't know exactly what it is. It's likely, I think, I agree with you. Not like a magical man in the sky, but there is some structure, and I it's just like I don't know exactly what that implies or means. But I, it's I think the th thing that I want to segue into is the ethnography part of your research and your work, which is that it feels like essentially every dominant religion, cultural practice has some sort of spiritual journey whether it's using psychedelics and it's it's emerging that potentially more of these cultures have used psychedelics to explore their spirituality and their internal journey than what we might have been led in modernity C curious to just you know just tease into that area where you know we can talk about ayahuasca the plant ceremonies in south america the illusion mysteries in greek potential you know spiked wines or beers in uh middle east and you know, something with, uh, you know, Soma in India and, you know, maybe who knows, right? Like there's just like a lot of potential overlapping traditions. Curious if you have a framework to, to think about it or break it down. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that psychedelics are, you know, we know they were at the root of a lot of these indigenous traditions, shamanic traditions, but also Western mystical traditions like the mystery school at Eleusis, for example, most likely involved consuming some form of ergotized barley. And then there's a new book that's just come out that looks into this in even more depth and, and very well researched that shows that psychedelics are intimately involved in probably most of the world's great religions. So there's nothing wrong with that. You know, Terence in his book, Food of the Gods, talked about this also. These plants, these substances are, you know, they're, 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 they're co-evolutionary partners, you know, essentially, especially mushrooms, which we have probably had a relationship for a couple of million years with these mushrooms because we evolved on the, on the in the in the plains of northern Africa, you know, which were much wetter than they are now, and there were there were rainy seasons, and and it was a much different environment than it is now. It's basically now it's a desert. Back in that time, it was a more or less it was a much wetter, more rainfall, and all that. We know there were cattle like animals there. The ancestors of the Cebu cattle were, were there. Fossil record, you know, the, has shown that these cattle were there around that time. Well, if you got rainfall and you got cattle and you got hominids, you got mushrooms for sure. I mean, you can look at any tropical ecosystem these days and see the same thing. And it's all about psilocybe cubensis, which is the pan-tropical psilocybin mushroom. You can go anywhere in the world, in Africa, Asia, South America, if you have the right habitats, the you know, pasture land or, or savannas and cattle, those mushrooms will be there. You know, they're, they're gonna, they show up during the rainy season. And the thing is, they're, they're not, uh, you know, these are not hard mushrooms to find. A lot of psilocybes are rather small and not particularly, you know, I mean, you have to be looking for them. It's something easy to overlook. Uh, Psilocybe commensis is not that way. You know, it's a very big, robust mushroom with a with a you know a golden cap. <laughs> it's hard to ignore. You know, and if, if you happen to be a primate in in this environment, a hominid, number one, you're probably hungry. 
you know, I mean, you're you're foraging for food, you're hunting these cattle, you're living off those and other types of ungulate beasts that are in the same area, but you know, you're foraging for anything that might be ed- edible. Well, eventually, you're gonna. I mean, the, inevitably, you're gonna stumble on these mushrooms and take the mushrooms, and interesting things will happen. You know, and then. You know, Terence's book, Food of the Gods, I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but he published that in 1992. And that was really the first articulation of this idea of the stoned ape theory. But, you know, to call it the stoned ape theory is is kind of dismissive. Like It's like, oh, yeah, sure, we ate mushrooms and we got smart, you know. I'm sorry, it's not that simple, and it doesn't do justification to the theory to say that. But since Terence wrote that book, actually there is a new edition coming out shortly after the first of the year, and I wrote the foreword to it, and in writing the foreword, I had to go back and read the book. And there are two important things that were not really on the radar in 1992. One of those is neuroplasticity, the idea that the brain can change, that populations of neurons can, you know, new neurons can grow, that the connectivity architecture of of the neural networks can change in response to external stimuli. It affects gene expression, essentially. And we know now that psilocybin and these sorts of things do affect these processes. You know, they increase connectivity. They actually lead to a reorganization of these networks, which is probably linked to their long-lasting therapeutic effects, right? So you got that mechanism, that's going on. The other thing that was not really understood that that well back in, uh, in the early 90s is epigenetics. And epigenetics is, again, a response of the genome to external stimuli. And many substances and, 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 and other types of things will affect gene expression. So it, this is a mechanism where, for instance, traits in the brain, changes in brain architecture can actually propagate through generations. And it's epigenetic inheritance. It doesn't involve the gametes, it doesn't involve the usual mechanisms that, that are we think of as involved in inherit, inheritance, which have to do with changes in the egg and the sperm. That's where the mutations have to be to be passed on to another generation. But epigenetics provides an alternative mechanism. And I think knowing what we know about what these compounds do in terms of changing the the the, the connectome, if you want to call it that, in the brain. And then there's a mechanism for that to propagate through time by epigenetics. That completely changes the, to my mind, that completely changes the plausibility of this stoned ape theory. It kind of shifts it over to, well, maybe it's plausible, perhaps it happened, I don't know, but now... If you put those elements into it, I think you I think it shifts it over to yes, more than likely this is probably what happened. Yeah, I mean those are like legitimate mechanisms, right? Like I think neuroplasticity is well accepted in literature. And I mean I think it also just implies why this is useful for PTSD therapeutics, where both epigenetically, you know, it's been well studied that stress can be passed epigenetically through offspring at least in animal models. I have some friends at Harvard Medical that showed that, and it was a, a very interesting paper. So if you can clip or alter the epigenetics of stress and other factors through psychedelics, interesting. And then two, I think the reference we talked about in the beginning in terms of lowering the filter, right? Resetting the neural pathways that might have trained, learned behaviors, and having a, kind of a, a, a new way to reset, repave these neural pathways to relearn and, and, and create new connections in this new connectome. Those seem like very plausible mechanisms to one, retroactively think about the stone ape theory in a, kind of a modern interpretation, but also two, just implying both applications for PTSD on the therapeutic side, as well as enhancement. I, I'm just thinking towards our biohacking audience. 
I mean, does this imply, hey, like there is some rhyme to reason in terms of doing microdosing or having a little bit of psychedelics before you learn a new skill set to, to potentially enhance learning? Is that, is that too far of a hypothesis? Have people formally studied this? Obviously, people have experimented with this personally with subjective anecdotes. Curious if you have you know, more anecdotes or, or some, some data there to buffer or detract from that theory. No, I, th I think it's a reasonable theory. And, and as you point out, epigenetic effects are not necessarily all beneficial. You know, you can have epigenetic effects from trauma and stress and that sort of thing that will propagate even through generations. So, you know, the, the uh, brain architecture, the neurochemical profiles and so on of the children and their children of people that have experienced trauma, you know, we now know that it can propagate. It can happen through environmental influences like that trauma and that sort of thing. But it can also happen through exposure to substances, you know, and psychedelics or other substances. Not all the epigenetic effects are, are beneficial. But in the case of psychedelics, they, you know, they probably are. And so that is a that is a potential mechanism that makes this makes this whole thing really quite quite a reasonable hypothesis you know um, the question is how do we test it and I don't know if there is any way to test it so you know we're free to speculate right <laughs> and, and we do freely yeah I think a lot of anthropology or evolutionary biology is just hard to run experiments right I think again talking about the model model of modern science is very much based on randomized controlled trials and i think some of these hypotheses yeah we can't run an experiment on primates you know circa 2 million bc right to, to just test this out but maybe there's fossil evidence or other anthropological well I, you know i mean not not when we're talking about those sorts of time frames you know I mean, we can we can look back. There's plenty of uh, evidence, you know, for the antiquity of the use of these psychedelics. But it, it only goes back so far. I just actually got an email the other day from uh, Mark Plotkin, who you may have heard of. He's he's a well-known ethnobotanist, and he's he was saying, you know, hey, what is the what is the evidence? What is the most ancient psychedelic that we know of, you know, and as it turned out, I had just recently got a paper on exactly this topic, and it turns out that the one that is best uh, documented, at least in the new world, is San Pedro Cactus or Wachuma which is a traditional psychedelic used in the Andes. It contains mescaline. It's, it's you know, essentially the, the chemistry is similar to peyote. That goes back to 9,000 years B.C. And, you know, there's archaeological evidence for this in the form of uh, iconography and and even ritual vessels and so on that can be analyzed and, you know, detect traces of these compounds. 9,000 years is recent, you know, compared to 2 million years. It's nothing. So, you know, you get beyond that, you get so far back, pretty soon the, 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 the trail of evidence dries up, you know. For example, you know, there there is a interesting artifact that was found in South Africa at one of no, wait, it was found in it was found in Indonesia. It was uh, part of the archaeological excavation for Java man who was not Homo sapiens. He was he or she or they were Homo erectus. So they were the species that preceded us. They excavated this archaeological site. They collected a lot of a lot of things associated with it, put them in museums, and then people spend time going through these collections in museums. So, but not that long ago, some someone. An archaeologist looking at it in in a museum. I think it was in Amsterdam. I'd have to I'd have to check the details. But they found this shell, uh, which had been clearly carved, you know, with geometric designs, basically. 
pretty crude stuff. I mean, not exactly the Mona Lisa, right? But clearly the product of a conscious mind. You know, someone had an idea and as best they could, they projected that on this shell. So it's essentially geometric designs. Why this is important is it's dated at 500,000 years. So you're beginning to push it back, you know, and there are these anomalous things, you know, uh, there's, well, that that's one of the oldest uh, artifacts that's been uncovered where clearly somebody had the ability to abstract an idea and put that idea out into the physical world in the form of scratches on a, on a shell, <laughs> you know? I mean, I'm just thinking, you just got me thinking what would be, uh, this would be, you know, obviously we don't want to be animal abuse or get IRB approval and whatnot, but I would wonder if we would feed psilocybin to gorillas over a few generations and see if they expand their cultural practices. Obviously, there is culture within chimpanzees and greater apes, and it would be an interesting experiment to just try to at least replicate some of the, can, can we accelerate cultural development if we ran an experiment, right? Just like thinking in terms of a experimentation context. It's a reasonable idea. You know, I mean, you could do it. Paul Stamets talks about, uh, he has reviewed some interesting information that shows that a lot of primates consume mushrooms, you know, as part of their diet. They uh, Whether they're psilocybin mushrooms is, is much less clear, but there is data on, you know, primates eating mushrooms just for nutrition. Paul is also, he is a believer in the stone ape theory. And, you know, I, I think it's a interesting hypothesis that we can't just dismiss out of hand, you know, and, and you could do experiments like that with primates, but then how many generations of again, you're up against this, uh, you know, this, this, this business about that we talked about, about you're looking at a multivariate situation here, you know, and, but certainly primates have culture and, uh, and, and crude culture compared to what we have. But I mean, I think the reason that the mushrooms are important in our evolution is that they were catalysts for our development of language. That was the thing. Culture runs on language and they facilitated language. Yeah. And I think one point that I thought was especially compelling that you had mentioned previously in the past and is the synesthesia where psychedelics often induce synesthesia and language is essentially like a very formalized version of synesthesia where these random arbitrary English sounds are communicating feelings, emotions, like objects and, you know, I'm telepathically inducing images into your brain, which is kind of magical if we think about how that works. Yeah. <laughs> You've been studying my stuff. Yeah. Th th this could come right out of my mouth. That's exactly that's exactly it. That's exactly what I've been saying. This that you know, they facilitate synesthesia and synesthesia is the association of a sound and an internal image or a, a sound and an image that is usually seen as significance that's that's the other thing it's not just you know they're symbols symbols have power because they're associated with i think the term is portentousness something that is meaningful and that that the whole thing that's the whole basis of language there you know and if you look at shamanic traditions uh, very often you know the, the chanting and the singing and all that that goes on in traditional shamanic ceremonies with mushrooms and psychedelics has to do with the induction of this synesthetic process you know i mean in ayahuasca traditional songs which are called ikaros are really intrinsic to the experience because they drive the hallucinations. So this, this goes on. There's, there's an ancient classic essay in, in a book that was published, I think, in like 1971 or something. It was called The Hallucinogens and Shamanism. We were 
still using the term shamanism at that time and or hallucinogens, which is kind of not the right term. But this this essay in this book by a man named Henry Moon, an anthropologist, was called The Mushrooms of Language. And he talked about how it, you know, in these deep psychedelic states with mushrooms, it stimulates the logos, essentially. It stimulates this internal impulse to articulate, to vocalize what you're experiencing. So, Yeah, just to double down and further explore this social cultural practices, I think when people talk about these conscious expanded states, there's also a lot of focus on meditation. Fasting is commonly associated with getting greater consciousness. So I think within our community, we, we are focus a lot on fasting in terms of just an interesting metabolic intervention. I'm curious to get your thoughts. How does psychedelics fit, stack, synergize, you know, coalesce with fasting, meditation? I mean, a personal hypothesis, I'm I'm, I'm not sure, you know, is that, is that when a Zen monk, when they're reaching enlightenment peak mental state, I'm just curious to get a brain scan of that brain versus someone that's you know on a psychedelic trip versus someone who's been fasting for 40 days versus someone that's been in, in claiming flow state where they're just feeling like everything is like flowing creatively do you think these are all very similar states are they just different paths the same uh, destination they're they're compounding interventions I'd love to get your thoughts on how you maybe connect all of these things. Well, as it turns out, there's been quite a bit of work done on this. So there, there is actually science out there, particularly Roland Griffith's group at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, they were the ones that came out originally with original studies with psilocybin for people at the end of their life, people with an end of life anxiety. You know, the ability of psilocybin to induce a mystical experience was kind of their focus, but then they have followed up and there have been several studies with his group and, and some in Europe of comparing like carrying out fMRI type brain scanning of people on psilocybin and people uh, experience meditators and looking at the similarities of the state of mind and actually doing some of in some of these protocols they gave experienced meditators psilocybin just what would they people who had never taken any psychedelic what would they make of it so there's actually quite a lot of information there's a great website one of, it's called clinicaltrials.gov and it's a it's a place you can go it's a government website and it's a place where they keep track of all these F, whatever is under development under FDA protocols whatever the drug is not restricted to psychoactive drugs, but this is your go-to source. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov and you search on psilocybin, all of these studies will come up. There are about 50 studies all told on psilocybin. And there are several studies with long-term meditators. And you're, you're a science nerd, right? So you also probably know about PubMed. Yep, yep, we're we're. Always on that. Yeah, another one of the few things our government does with our tax dollars that I fully endorse, <laughs> you know, because it's it's the it's the National Library of Medicine portal into all the life science and biomedical literature. So PubMed is a very good place to go to, you know, if you structure the search right, these things will come up, and that that's just something that people should know about if they are, don't already. This is how you get into the peer-reviewed literature, to the actual, you know, hardcore biomedical literature. And if you search on PubMed, it'll also come up. For example, there's like, I think around uh, 260 articles in PubMed on ayahuasca, you know. And back in the day when I was doing my research, there were under a dozen. So... So that tells you right there, it's a, it's an evolving field, you know? Yeah. I think it's just a responsibility of the academy to publish this in a way that everyone can read. Right. I, I think that's 
you know, from a religious context, that's the Reformation. You you let people read the Bible, like the, the raw data itself, rather than have these like high priests or these ac- academics saying, hey, I, I have to be an interpreter for you. And I think that's, I think the progress of Excel, I, I think that's part of the inflection point where I think folks can, you know, we have 50,000 plus subscribers in the HVMN community, every one of them, we can like go look at these papers on PubMed or clinical trials like gov and just see for ourselves, is this BS? Is this some mystical weird stuff or is there some legitimate data here? And I think, again, I, my sense of that, like, I don't even care if it's like right or wrong. I just want the truth. Right. And I think we just need as like a community to just see what works and understand ourselves. That's what I care about ultimately. Yes, and and that's one of the good things about the internet is that all this information is open to everybody. Like Pub PubMed is open source worldwide. Anyone in the world can access it. Now the interpretation of some of this data, some of these things, maybe you need some some scientific expertise, you know, to do that, but you can access these things. And you know, and that that's very good. And and they always they they always have abstracts, so they they'll at least summarize what the paper's about. And you may not understand you know the nuts and bolts, but you can get an idea from the abstract what it's about, what the outcomes are, and so on. So so anyway, the, those are useful tools. Yeah, and also in terms of useful tools, I know that you've kicked off McKenna Academy which I know is a repository of some of the knowledge here. So I'd love to learn more about that project as well as projects that you're working on in 2020, rest of the year in 2021. I mean, where do you plan on spending your time in terms of moving this movement forward? What are you most excited about? Well, originally the McKenna Academy, I mean, the McKenna Academy is, uh, you know, I call it a modern mystery school, you know, and, and founded in the spirit of elusive. Essentially, I want it to be the first psychedelic university in 1500 years. And, you know, in which psychedelics are not the sole topic uh, under consideration, but very central to the mission and actually acknowledges the, the uh, you know, potential of these substances to be learning tools. So, in that sense, sometimes I say the McKenna Academy will be the first university where not all the faculty are human, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, so, it, it, and natural philosophy is what science used to be before it became reductionist, before it became uh, quantitative and, and sort of, I think it lost a lot. Natural philosophy is what science emerged from. But natural philosophy recognizes there are different ways of knowing. They, it's not always reductionist and, and what can be measured and quantified. There are different ways of knowing. Talk to any shaman and they'll tell you the same thing or anyone who's had psychedelic experiences. So the McKenna Academy is, you know, we're evolving it. We we are making it up as we go along in a certain way. But basically... A number of things are important. We want it to be a forum and a a meeting place, if you will, where great, brilliant people can come together and we can talk about amazing ideas having to do with all of these questions, you know, plant-human coevolution, psychedelics, our place in nature, our place in the cosmos, and that sort of thing. Of course, COVID has changed our agenda a lot. What we originally intended to do and hope to get back to it is to be able to have physical conferences and retreats and that sort of thing in South America. You know, that that's what I what I've been doing for, you know, good ten or fifteen years. We can't do that anymore. So we're trying to do stuff that's online. And you can look at our resources and events page and, and see what we've done. Right now, what we're involved with is, uh, well, we, we do these online events. We just did one not long ago about symbiosis. And then in April, we did a series of podcasts called Tribute to Terrence, which was open access over about five weeks. And it was basically to, to honor my brother, 
he passed away in the year 2000, in April 2000. So we wanted to kind of honor that. And we had a great response. You know, we had 10,500 people register for that, which is, you know, amazing to me. I mean, yeah, like, huge. what? This guy doesn't do anything for publicity. He's been dead for 20 years and he gets 10,000 people. I should be so lucky, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but anyway, that's okay. that's okay. So there is that, and one of the projects that we're working with right now is, is there's an amazing uh, scientist in Peru that I've worked with for really for 50 years. Ever since I well, not quite long, almost ever since I went there as a graduate student. He's a botanist. He has tremendous encyclopedic knowledge of the plants in around Iquitos in Loreto province. He never writes anything down, right? It's all in his head. So we're trying to get a project going to basically document what this guy knows before he goes, before he passes on, because he knows a tremendous amount. He's one of these people of whom Mark Plotkin said, when a medicine man dies, it's as though a library has burned down. Well, my friend Juan, he is that library, you know, and I've been after him for years. Juan, for God's sake, why don't you write down all this stuff? He said, oh, why should I write it down? It's all up here, you know. That's the point. <laughs> you know, you're not going to live forever. So we're working on what we call the knowledge protection and recovery project with Juan, and he's actually the curator of the herbarium at UNAP, the Universidad Nacional Amazonia Peruana in Iquitos. So I've, I've worked with him since since I was a graduate student, since I first came there in 1981. So that that is going to be a, a long-term, pretty ambitious project to do with him. And then uh, we have, on the other hand, on the other side, we have some different podcast series and, 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 and you know, teaching events. For example, we're going to do a series on, on mystery schools with my friend Alexandre Tanu, who is a sound therapist and ethnomusicologist and, and really an amazing scholar of... Uh, sound, per, you know, sound and sound therapy, particularly in in terms of uh, the induction of altered states and that kind of thing. So we got lots going on. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm excited to tune in and follow along as as all these th threads keep going. I mean, it feels like the time is right in terms of the inflection point where this hopefully can just better our culture, better our happiness, better our overall, you know, human civilization here. So. Appreciate you, you know, fighting the good fight here, and again being persistent over literally five decades to uh, help drive the conversation along. So I feel like we could have like you know continue for another hour and a half here, but we'll let uh, we'll let we'll, we'll we'll put a pause here and have a have a check of a bookmark to come back and explore some of these topics and answer some additional questions that might come from the HVM audience. But again, thanks so much for taking the time, Dennis. This is a phenomenal conversation. Okay, very good. Yeah, I had a good time. I appreciate being invited. All right, cheers. Cheers.